Hi everybody, welcome back to the Tokyo Show with your host Nicholas Pettis. Today we're doing chapter 8 of the Blue-Eyed Samurai. Okay, so training with Sosai. Let's get into a little bit about that. Every week, uh, Sosai had four scheduled classes that he would teach. The first one would be Thursday from 1 o'clock, which was a special Uchideshi class. Only first and second year Uchideshi was allowed in this class. So it was a very exclusive class with Sosai. Uh, this was... Uh, yeah, only uh, it was an hour and a half uh, class uh, where Solsai would teach us many kinds of different things. Mostly, he loved to see us kick. And when I say kick, I really mean kick. He would make us kick and kick and kick. Whew. That's a lot of kicking, like literally thousands of repetitions. Like we did Mike Yag's 45 minutes straight one time, uh, but kicking the whole time. Uh, sorry. So the whole class uh, would be nothing but kicking the whole time. Uh, it had to be over your head level. Like if it's Mike Yag, he wanted this to kick really, really high. Um, I'd always been quite supple. And during the time with my broken toe, I'd been able to work on my full split. And now I was kicking higher than ever before. Yeah, I actually uh, broke my two toes that we spoke about earlier on. And... Um, during those times, I was stretching so much that um, I got like perfect full splits, like psh, left, right, and in the middle and everything. It was great. Um, I would often lie on my back and read books with my legs spread up, uh, spread up against the wall. So yeah, um, lying down on, on your back and then like just have the feet open up in the splits and I would just lie there. And then uh, just, yeah, I got really flexible from that actually. If you guys want to work on your flexibility, that's a, that's a good exercise to do. Um, I wanted to show Sosai that I could kick higher and better and faster than any of the others. They were all good, having been in Japan longer than me and training with Sosai for so long. However, I was not going to give up and I gave it everything I had and it started to pay off. On Fridays, uh, Sosai had a black belt class from 7 o'clock, which I was not to allow, allowed to attend to. On coming to Japan, I decided to do as the Japanese and start as a white belt, although I had been already a first Q brown belt uh, back in Denmark. So I could not join class until one morning Sosai came in while he was cleaning while I was cleaning the main dojo. So my cleaning area was the actual dojo. Uh, I cleaned that dojo every day for three years, um, just wiping everything down. So Sosai comes up uh, on his way to um, uh, to the office before the, the morning ceremony, and so you could always hear. You always know when he's coming because uh, there's always one uchideshi outside a home booth waiting for him. So you could hear when he goes, "Oh, Sosai, like that. And so, ooh, oh, Sosai's coming, right? And then you're always standing there and you wait for Sosai to come up. And then he normally just does this. He go, hmm, oh, yo. Well, he just doesn't say anything. He just waves his hands and, and walks upstairs, you know? But that morning, he looked at me, he goes. So I go, oh, Sosai, And Sosai goes, Kimi, do you think you were not here? So, it's like, like, this is well, hilarious because... Um, <laughs> I had just gotten my yellow belt, and then he's yelling at me for not being in black belt class yesterday. Oh man, this was hilarious. Um, so I was like, uh, So at this point, I, I learned to speak a little bit of Japanese, um, but I didn't know that I could join into that class. So I just like uh, apologized for it. And after that, uh, I literally joined in on all the black belt classes. Uh, it was really weird, man. Yeah, the first day I walked into a black belt class with my yellow belt on, uh, everyone looked at me like they wanted to kill me. <laughs> Uh, I told them, Sosai told me to join the class and they seemed to, to be pissed off more than anything else. Um, but they all knew that I was up to the standard, if not over their standard. So in the end, they couldn't say much. When Sosai came in that class, he saw me sitting down in the back and he looked at me and nodded. He did this, you know, you know, when, when someone walks in, he goes, mm. 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 and then he never said anything after that. Um, it was a great experience to train with the cream of, of Hombu, uh, Hombu, like the best, you know, they were all the, the long, strong senpais and the atmosphere was so thick that you could feel it way down on you. I lived for those classes where you never know what would happen. Sosai was always full of energy and his personality was like pairing a jar full of bees up close to a honeypot. <laughs> wow. I didn't, I can't believe I wrote that. That's hilarious. Uh, you never knew what that, when that lid will come off and all hell would break loose. At the same time, it was like watching the man you would give your life for standing there in front of you, giving you instructions. I can't really explain the true feeling of how it was to train with soul but no matter how tired you were, uh, from the life around you, like that hard dormitory life was, was just, you know, really like heavy down on you, but getting on a dogi and wearing at the dogi with Sosai just made it absolutely all worth it. You know, it was it was timeless um, to train with Sosai because you, you could just feel that when you're breathing the same air as Sosai that you were probably going to get stronger. That's what we felt. That's what I felt anyway. 
On Saturdays, uh, Sosai would have a two-hour class for all the regular students and all Uchizashi had to join this class because we were needed to take control of everyone else and show them how the training should be done with Sosai. It was in this class that Sosai first noticed me. I would be at the back doing my, my high accurate kicks and, some, and sometimes Sosai would just stop the whole class. And yeah, so sometimes Sosai would just stop the whole class and so, Oi, da costa. <laughs> for the first six months he, he called me da costa, right? So I'd come out in front and say, Oss! And I was like, and uh, you would then like, Ai, Migi, Sanchindachi, Oi, Kamaite! Right, and then you would open up for whatever stance that he'd call like zinkstachi, like that. So Migi, zinkstachi, Oi, Kamaite! Ai, Mai Kyagi, Itch! Ai, Sam! And that's exactly how Sosai sounded like. Um, and I would do all these Mike Yagas, and I loved it. I loved it because it gave me the energy to be able to show off. And at the same time, it meant that I wouldn't back down from the standard I had showed in front of everyone else because I knew that they would be looking. I was... I was able to really push myself the whole time. The first time got me in trouble when Solsai started doing the uh, this, uh, <laughs> the first time got me in trouble when Solsai started doing the same thing during the backplot classes. None of my senpais would stand for this, and they made sure that I got what I deserved. <laughs> but not during any of Solsai's classes, though. Solsai knew that if we did sparring, it would be war. Like literally, it, we hardly never sparred in Solsai's class because it's like if you were just imagine that you wanted to show Solsai that you're the strongest like, man. When he had sparring, and I only think we did it like two times or three times, like during the three years, it was crazy. He would hit the drum, and I was like, you know, coming to hit the drum like this, and then people would just go right into it, man. Um, and then he would, uh, strangely enough, he like hit the drum like ten seconds into it, like an, like that. And so it was like she was just like rotating for only five, ten seconds each fight. Uh, yeah, it was it was really bizarre actually. Um, but I think it's very understandable. Uh, if I had the chance to beat someone up in front of Solsai, I totally would do it. <laughs> anyway, everyone wanted to prove themselves in front of Solsai and hopefully get some kind of recognition showing uh, that he noticed you during sparring. This meant it was all about. Uh, it, yeah, this meant that it was all out in front of Solsai. The two three times we actually did sparring with Solsai, watching someone always got hurt. But at the same time, we knew uh, we all had. We all felt the same. Yeah. Uh, when. Yeah, so I already explained that. On Sunday, Solsai had the last class of the week, and it was a class uh, for black and brown bills. I joined in on this class as well as the one on Friday nights. For some strange reason, this class, which started at 3.30, always seemed to fit in your schedule and break the habit of not doing anything on Sundays. Uh, it's really weird, yeah. It also uh, made the Sundays go by a lot quicker, so I really enjoyed these classes. Uh, generally speaking, I would do uh, morning training on Sundays also from 6 a.m., uh, have like the hour run and all the other stuff, right? And then from 10 a.m., there would be a class that I would also join in. It's like a two-hour class. And then had this uh, 3.30 class in the afternoon. So yeah, it, it was actually a lot of training on Sundays. Um, so it was great. Um, after class, when the weather was good, we would always end up in front of the dojo uh, in our dogies practicing our high kicks or something like that. During the afternoon, there would always be that setting sun shining down on our backs from Mount Fuji. And this created uh, a certain kind of atmosphere. Uh, just standing outside there in front of the hombu, you could like see yourself in the reflection of the door because uh, it was a glass door. And then so we would just be standing outside uh, on the concrete, uh, bare feet, and just practicing high kicks. Um, yeah, it was, it was just like really a cool thing to do for us Uchideshis. Um and uh, it might sound weird, uh, but <laughs> really, uh, he was like a god to all of us. Uh, a simple word or gesture would be as much as we could hope for. And so we always did our best to get recognized or get a chance to exchange a word or two with our master. In the end, it was always cool just to sit there and see one of the other guys look at his own reflection in the mirror, working on some kind of technique. Um, with all of us commenting on the outcome of the kick or the punch or the best way of improving it. Um, and then someone else would stand up and throw through kicks and we would always uh, be talking about it. Yeah, so we always ended up out, outside Hombu, um, you know, discussing how the kicks are and practicing the axe kicks or practicing the uh, the mashigiris and stuff like that. And just like always looking at each other, hey man, maybe you should try a little bit of this, man. But honestly, uh, me and Judd, uh, and we were doing this all the time. We had incredible techniques back then. Uh, when I think back about how flawless those kicks were, it's like, of course we got good at them because we were like literally doing them all day. 
Man, it was awesome. Uh, soon it would be dinner time and we would all head back to the dorm. Sundays were different from other days. Uh, after I had stayed for about four months, I was allowed to watch TV with some of the foreigners on Sunday evenings for about two hours. Yeah, we had this tiny little TV and we'd sit down in the, in the, in the kitchen and just like sit there and watch TV. And even if I didn't understand what was going on, it was just, you know, breaking routine. It was kind of nice. Uh, sometimes Mukaram, being a third year student, would be nice enough to go down to the local video store and rent the movie for us. So yes, with the leftovers from Saturday's dinner with Sosai and, an, and a video that we could watch almost undisturbed, Sundays turned out quite well actually. Yeah, I really enjoyed the Sundays. Uh, there are basically three classes running every day uh, from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and then from 7 to 9. And each class had its group of regulars and instructors which made up for the atmosphere in that class. For example, in the morning class, it was always Minami Senpai who was teaching. Now, I know I shouldn't be writing this, but um, but even Solsai used to tell him off for how bad his karate was. I have to admit you, <laughs> yeah, though you couldn't fault his extreme passion for karate, his love for karate was and still is unrivaled in anyone I have met until this day. His whole life is about training and becoming at one with himself. For this, he has sacrificed everything and even today lives a very simple life with just the pleasure of training. However, although his dedication is one of such commitment, his technique really never seems to have changed from it. For me to describe this without making him seem foolish is very hard, but for the people who know him, uh, everything is, is simply just said, Minami Senpai. He was just this little tiny guy with just like the shortest arms and everything, and he just really couldn't lift his legs over his head. It was, uh, yeah, we used to make a lot of fun of him. Really sorry about that. He's a great guy. Really nice, actually. Uh, Minami Senpai taught the Ichibu 10 o'clock class uh, for the first two years that I was with Chideshi. And he had more than 25 students every day. Uh, it's crazy because he literally taught the same class every day for two years straight. Like, he didn't change anything in it. He did the same stretch. He did the same kihon, which was a part of uh, each class of, of hombu training anyway. So that was just part of the regimen. But the way he did the ido geiko and the way he did the kata, it was like the same every time. He had it down to like a, a fine detail, but people like that. I think they enjoyed it. I think it's like doing a class of yoga where you have a set thing and then just, you just stick with that one set thing. Um, yeah, people were, were, were really happy to come and train with him, actually. Uh, <laughs> I think even today I can remember exactly what he would do for Ido Geiko and what will come after what. I guess it was uh, kind of this a simplicity that the students liked because people uh, don't like too many surprises in the morning. <laughs> I'm just speculating there. Knowing exactly what is coming next can actually help you prepare mentally for the job at hand. It's going to give you an idea also where you need to push yourself and where you don't need to push yourself. Uh, I used uh, this class to try and motivate myself and work on my mental aspect of training. I figured that if I just followed uh, like everyone else, I would lose the self-respect and fighting spirit I had brought with me. I also hoped that we might get to do some sparring and I would get a chance to show what my opinion of everything was. This never happened. After the first time I got to spar with Minami Senpai and I gave him a nosebleed from kicking him in the head, uh, I know it wasn't nice, but I figured I would be the, the, the only chance I ever get to show him how good I was. And uh, yeah, I took it. You know, even though he was a nice guy, we were still living in a small world and things normally wouldn't mean much, um, uh, but... But things that normally wouldn't mean much become huge issues. Like, why should I listen to this man when his karate is worse than mine? It was such a violent world and so rough. Rough in the sense that everything came down to who was better or who was stronger. And you became so arrogant towards someone who uh, seemed lesser than yourself. We all used to make fun of the less fortunate. And this is far from the true teachings of martial arts. But we became very self-centered back then. Today, I feel ashamed to admit to sharing such thoughts about my fellow men, but we were all very young and there was so much, uh, so much still to learn. It was easy to just go along with the laughter, uh, but the truth is I have nothing but respect for Minami Senpai. Uh, Nibu, uh, the 4 o'clock, 4 p.m. class, was always uh, taught by one of the third-year students. The students in this class were mostly students and people who worked at night and, of course, any of the Uchideshi that had the time to train for it. Mukaram would sometimes teach his class, and he was a very talented karateka who ran an excellent class. He really ran a great class, actually. I think he was a better teacher than, than a karate guy, actually. Uh, I think maybe he was a better teacher than a fighter because he loved to make everyone work and put a kiai at the right time. You could always be sure who would be doing sparring at the end of the class, as we all wanted to do sparring. Whenever he was teaching the class, Judd and I would show up. I was scared of Judd the whole first year I was there. He was already the Australian lightweight champion. By the time he started Uchideshi, he had a black belt. Uh, he'd been a black belt for quite some time. Um, at Hombu, black belts were treated differently. 
Like for real, if you had a black belt, everything was different. A black belt could do self-training and use the weights and so on. So it was quite a big difference between being a colored belt or not. I really wanted to go for my black belt test after the first year like Sosa had encouraged me to, but I didn't know if I would be allowed to. At the rate everyone else was grading, I would only make it the brown belt in the first year. This meant I would not get to the shot at the black belt until the end of my second year. This was simply not good enough for me. I had my mind set and when the time came, I would ask permission. Um, anyway, that was still more than six months uh, down the line uh, and I had just been allowed to join the black belt class being a yellow belt. So um, I was getting my head a little bit uh, <laughs> ahead of myself at that time. It was in this class, Nibu, that I got to spar with Ligo for the first time. Uh, he was from Taekwondo uh, background. Apparently, a cousin of Sosai had moved to South Carolina, opened up a school of Taekwondo, Korean Taekwondo. And it was there Ligo had started his uh, martial arts training. But with that kind of uh, start, he was never quite able to adapt to the Kyokushin way of fighting. He always tried to kick his way out of everything. So the first time I sparred with him, he tried to show me uh, who was the senpai. <clears throat> but I had my own idea. Uh, <laughs> I had my own idea. Yeah. Um, anyway, I managed to kick him in the, in, in the tooth. And I, I think I chipped one of his front teeth, actually. Um, uh, and after that, he knew that he would never beat me. It was pretty simple. Uh, I was establishing my own place uh, within the hierarchy. At that time, I was still uh, somewhere in the middle because uh, there were not really a chance for me to show what I could do. Amongst the, the foreigners, uh, we seemed to have our own system, which had nothing to do with the Japanese. It was essentially to find your own position. With the Japanese, there was also a place to be found, although it would take me another two years uh, to find out where I really was amongst them. Uh, Sambu was a class where all the black belts would show up because it was the time of day when almost uh, everybody had time to train. The class started at 7. Uh, the only thing wrong with this class was that the black belts hardly ever did the first half of the class. The basic training would last for 45 minutes. Yes, it was a set thing for 45 minutes, basic training. And then we would do Ido Geiko for another 45 minutes. Uh, this would leave about 30 minutes uh, left for the two-hour class that we used to run. And uh, this would be either spent on kata or kumite. Um, mostly kumite though. So it always happened <laughs> that about 20, 15, like 15 minutes after 8 o'clock, uh, 10 black belts would roll into the back of the class. Everyone would go white in their faces because you knew that they would be sparring that night. Oh man, this was so intimidating. The black belts were downstairs uh, when class started and just like stretching out and doing their own thing. And then, yeah, after 8 o'clock, they all just rolled up and did uh, like 10 minutes of the, of the Ido Geiko to warm up their bodies and then it would be on, man. Damn, this was so scary. This was really intimidating. Uh, but this was just the way all the black belts uh, had like di a different treatment. Um, back in the start of the 70s, there had been an incredible boom with the martial arts in Japan due to the selling of a comic called uh, Karate Baga Ichidai. It was a story about Oyama Mastat's life from the beginning uh, through his years in the mountains and everything like that, all the way up until the world championships in 1975. Uh, there was also a great following in Japanese kickboxing le le legend, uh, Sawamura Tadashi, who also had his own cartoon strip. Uh, I think even Bruce Lee had quite an influence on the young Japanese of the time. So yeah, back in the 70s, um, this is an incredible amount of students. Um, and then Soulsai became like this legend uh, at the time. Um, because of this incredible inc interest for martial arts, there would be so many students joining Hombu every day that there was just not enough room for them. They started uh, lining some up on the stairways uh, that filled up the first floor dojo and people were standing outside doing ki um, It was really, really crazy. Um, so what happened was uh, they, they were getting this overflow of students, right? And um, the black belts, uh, without even thinking about it, just made a conscious decision that they, they needed to beat people up so, so that they wouldn't come back because they, there was no space for everyone to train. So during those days, it was really only like the survivors, like the survivors of the fittest, right? So the strongest that stayed and the hardest minders that were able to stay. Uh, but they were like literally knocking people out like daily. And so that trend about how it's okay to spar as hard as you want with your Kohai uh, for the black belts uh, was still there when I when I first joined. Uh, I, I don't know what it is like now. Um. Uh, even uh, shoo, shoo, shoo. So even today, it's deemed uh, within the rights of the black belt uh, to beat up the other students. I found it terrifying and horrible, and no excuse at all fighting like that was good enough for me. Uh, I knew, however, that if I could not force myself to overcome the fear of joining the class and surviving the sparring, I would not be able to be the strong fighter that Sosa wanted to praise for. So I decided that I would do every class, no matter how scared I was. It was in this class that I got the experience of real Kyokushin firsthand. When the timer's right, the instructor would stop the class and have everybody sit down on a long line against the wall. 
the black belts would sit over here on the other side facing everybody uh, depending on how many there were they would then call you up in turn so all the black belts would then stand up say there's five black belts then they pull up the first five guys from the from the from the kohai that are then sitting around the edge of the wall and then they would spar and then they would rotate those five guys and then sit them all down and then rotate them back so the black belts would be doing all the rounds uh, there was a senpai called Sugimura. He was a big man of about 100 kilos, strong, uh, with no bone of mercy in him. He was the sort of leader for all the other black belts, and he was scary. Like, I used to hate and fear him. Hate him because he would beat everyone up, and, and fear because he would also beat me up. Uh, he was the kind of black belt who had the power and technique uh, to make it to the top, but still didn't quite know how to win in a tournament. Uh, because of this, uh, he, uh, he lacked recognition and fame. Uh, to compensate for this lack, he would try to redeem himself by taking it out on the less fortunate. I have seen a lot of young and upcoming fighters do the same, including me. I used to experiment on my uh, lower grades to see how my technique could work and if I could change it a bit. Uh, it went through. I went through a good two, three years where all I could do was think of destroy everything that was in front of me. Now I got to put this into uh, to context because um, you, it was just the way it was. Um, we were, we were, you know, this culprit of. of pit bulls like you know all pushed together in, in this like it really like testosterone high uh, environment where everything uh, was really dependent on who could become the strongest um as a Sugimura senpai uh, who we ended up calling the razorback um he <laughs> the first time he sparred me um he, uh, he had me up against the wall bam dropped me with a low kick and broke my rib true story and then i didn't know that you have to say mighty master mighty master in japanese means that you give up so he started uh, literally like stomping and, and uh, like just stomping on me. I've never experienced this. Like have someone stomping on you while you're on the ground with a broken wrist, uh, with a broken rib, right? And he was uh, he was scary in, in, a, in a whole different way. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to get to that part of the story where I actually uh, respect him. But in the beginning, the first year, oh man, it was, it just felt like it was, it was, intentionally just trying to 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 like destroy the foreigners you know he just didn't want us there i felt very racist also but um i know now that he's not racist um the environment created and bred that kind of attitude which today i despise there is no need for beating anyone lesser up than yourself for your own satisfaction because it teaches you nothing in fact it clouds the mind and when you face someone of true value and true strength you will find that you're not equipped with the tools or the knowledge of how to face this kind of opponent once you have understood this not just through reading uh this kind of material but truly understood it and it and, and what it implies uh, then you will be able to benefit from even the weakest opponents now, I'm going to pause here and go off script again a little bit. And I think we are pretty much into where we want to be today. But yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. So um, for training with someone uh, when you are sparring, um, if, you, if you think of them as tools to help them better yourselves, you got to respect how they can and what they can and can't do. Um, you can't expect them to be better than they are. Um, so even if you're training with someone who's weaker than yourself, you could still use them for something uh, that you can uh, like uh, get value out of. Um, I trained many, many years with only my kohai and there was none of them that were even close as good as I was. But I, I rotated them and I, and, I, and I thought of ways how to fight, uh, looking for better timing and, and, and everything. So uh, in the end of it, it was just more about uh, honing my skills uh, to get better at fighting. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the chapter. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be back again sometime soon.